Hey, welcome everyone to Independence Amplified in Maryland. Um, this is a, a live stream that um, we do weekly. It's run by Maryland Centers for Independent Living. We bring on um, people and um, who come with great topics of interest um, to the disability community. Um, if you could please make sure to stay muted um, for the presentation or the, the whatever Jade's gonna do. I don't know if you have a presentation, but Jade's um, piece, that would be great. And then um, typically we wait till the end for questions. Um, so if you have questions and are able to use the chat feature, you can put them in there as they come up and we'll make sure we get to them at the end. Um, if you're not able to use the chat, just wait until the end and um, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Um, the, this meeting is being recorded as you got the notice um, and it will be forever lived on YouTube. So um, if you don't wanna be a part of that, I suggest that you leave. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to Jade. Jade, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, and I don't have a formal presentation um, for a variety of, of reasons, um, but I'm Jade Gingrich. I am Director of Employment Policy for the Maryland Department of Disabilities. Um, I actually precede the, the creation of the department by a number of years. I previously served as Executive Director of the Governor's Committee on Employment to People with Disabilities which morphed into um, employment policy when the department was created. I also am currently serving as the um, MDOD representative to the Statewide Independent Living Council, um, which I am very excited about because um, I feel like employment is such a key element of independent living. What I'm also excited about is the fact that at the federal level, um, we are starting to see some alignment of the vision and values um, across all of the different policy areas for people with disabilities, um, including um, employment um, and the settings. So under um, some changes that happened with the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, which was federal legislation, it has lots of different moving parts. But one of what one of the elements that um, was particularly exciting was this attention on um, subminimum wage, um, which impacts on the settings where people are served um, in alignment with the home and community based waiver services. And states were required to actually reach out to everybody who is currently making subminimum wage in a shelter workshop um, to inform them of choices and opportunities. Maryland decided to take it a step further, further thanks to um, the work of um, some really strong advocacy. Um, and Maryland has actually eliminated subminimum wages here in Maryland, um, which means that all of the um, uh, organizations that were previously paying individuals subminimum wage um, are no longer able to do so, and they actually had to provide supports and services to um, transition folks into more meaningful individualized days that are integrated and in the community. And I feel like that really brings an alignment with that independent living, um, right? Because the whole independent living move movement is about being able to live in individualized, integrated settings in your community. So I feel like we're, we're finally, however many years into the game, starting to sort of align across all of these policy areas, um, similar things. That's not to say that we don't still have work to do, um, but as I was telling my um, providers a number of years ago, um, I wouldn't be investing in buildings. Um, in fact, we have a lot of providers that are looking for ways to, um, to shed the buildings that they have, um, aside from office space. Um, you know, there's still a need for office space and places for people to gather and to meet um, between COVID community waiver settings as well as changes on the course innovation and opportunity act the emphasis really on having people be individualized and integrated in the community across all aspects of their lives so that's exciting um so but I, there are some things under the workforce innovation and opportunity act that i think were well intentioned by the federal government um however uh, one of the things as, as a student of policy that I see many times is that they have these noble ideas um, and they don't understand the potential implications. Um, and, um, and, 
And because they don't understand the states and also local, because Maryland is very much a local controlled state, um, they, they do these things and um, sometimes in their desire to do good actually do more harm than good. Um, and one of the areas in which that um, has certainly become clear is the addition of pre-employment transition services, which on the face of it, add some really great services like that emphasis on self-advocacy, um, which I know many of the SILs are provided, um, are be providing the services. And, you know, even bringing the SILs in to provide those services was a really great action thing. So you're, you're probably thinking to yourself, well, how is this a bad thing? Well, the feds in their infinite wisdom said, hey, we're going to broaden the definition of disability. Um, so anyone um, whose doctor says, yes, they have a disability can be eligible for pre-employment transition services. Um, and with that broadening, it meant that there are significantly more people el eligible and it's an entitlement. So if you have a disability, you are entitled to re receive that service, which again, sounds great, except that they didn't add any additional funding. So what the result has meant is that for all states across the country, but also Maryland in particular, um, the access to the full VR services um, and Maryland just for historic purposes has not served um, all all potentially eligible individuals with disabilities since the 1990s. There's three categories. So when states have to limit who they access services to and for, there's three categories. It's called order of selection and, and VR must um, prioritize individuals with the most significant disabilities first. Then there's that midsection and Maryland um, goes in and out of the midsection in terms of, of serving those individuals. Um, right now there's a multi-year waiting list for um, that group um, and they're no longer actually attaching a number to how long you could be on that waiting list because it's that long. Um, and then there's a group of individuals with disabilities um, typically individuals with non-obvious disabilities, um, attention deficit disorder, learning disabilities, individuals with disabilities nonetheless who, ha who have not been served since the 1990s by Maryland VR. And yet the feds continue to sort of make these broad pronouncements that everything should go through into VR um, without recognizing that in, in, in setting that up, we're creating expectations that our, our system and our funding just can't fulfill. And so now you have this new entree of um, thousands of additional youth um, into the system. And what that has meant is that particularly for folks who maybe were in their 30s or 40s, um, who lost jobs as a result of COVID, who want to re-enter the workplace, um, you may be discovering that you're being put on a wait list and nobody can tell you how long it's going to be till you receive services. Um, that is further compounded by the fact that doors, like many, many other places, including um, NBA and so forth, um, is having some um, staffing issues. Um, to date, as I last anecdotally, I was told they have 31 open positions, um, which further impacts on the ability to access services. Uh, I was told that in the Howard County area, um, there's only like two staff people for like the entire region. So that has significant implications as well. And I'm providing some of this information um, in the hopes that you all in your role can help us with our education and awareness um, so that we, so that as you're talking or raising these things, um, you can use it to help make the case for doors um, as opposed to just beating up on doors. Not that there aren't days and times where doors perhaps deserves some of that, but um, but some of these things are really sort of beyond beyond their control and their power. Um, and, and I think it's really important, particularly from the education and awareness standpoint, we have a lot of attention focused on the needs of DDA. Um, and yet I very rare, rarely hear about the needs of um, vocational rehabilitation. Um, so those eligibility changes had some implications. Um, so good news, bad news. Um, Maryland was actually one of the states prior to the creation of pre-employment transition services that was doing a lot around transition. Um, but the federal government um, decided that some of what we were doing 
didn't count under this new environment. So we had to actually undo some of the good things that we were doing. Um, and so that has had an impact as well. Um, and they also said, um, we're also going to include uh, WIOA covers, not just vocational rehabilitation, RSA is one part of that. Um, but the other part of that is a system that's called the America's Job Centers. Um, and they're an interesting, they were formerly known as the One Stop Career Centers. Um, and they function as a source of access to information and jobs and training for anyone, whether or not they have a disability. Um, although they have a series of um, individuals under the term disadvantaged who are eligible and disability, um, disability is among those, um, which is great. Um, but they were also forced to place their emphasis on, um, on um, at what are considered out of school youth. Um, so again, 75% um, of their funds have to be focused on, on a population as well. Um, the America's Job Centers still should be a source for individuals with disabilities, particularly if they're on the wait list for door services or anyone who's seeking employment, everyone should be able to access something. However, as opposed to doors, which is controlled at the state level, um, the America's Job Centers get some funding from the federal government through the state and the state has a little bit of power and oversight, but for the most part, the local America's Job Centers have control. Um, you may have seen the same thing as it relates to education. You may have seen the issues around masking, not masking, opening up, not opening up, and so forth. Education is very much locally controlled. Um, where you all can play a role is partnering with your local America's Job Centers because they're going to be getting significant amounts of funding through um, the Recovery Act funds um, that the state we thought, yay, you know, there's some things that we wanting to do. Maybe this will give us some resources to be able to expand um, that access and opportunity um, at the AJCs. However, um, the state doesn't have the power. However, you all in your relationships um, with the America's Job Centers could be helping them to ensure that as they're thinking about where they're going to be spending those dollars that they get to ensure that that they're serving job seekers with disabilities, particularly those job seekers with disabilities who may be on the wait list for um, Division of Rehabilitation Services. Um, and Lori, I did see your question and I will be covering that shortly um, as it relates to hiring. Um, Kristen Patterson is the Director of Youth and Disability or the Coordinator of Youth and Disability for the America's Job Centers. Um, and certainly, if you encounter some barriers or concerns, always feel free to bring them to my attention so that I can raise them to her. Um, I know that they are working on particularly the access um, for individuals who are blind um, and that access to um, assistive technology. Um, the, but the America's Job Centers were also closed down as a result of COVID, which also impacted on ac access um, and so forth. But depending on, the level of services and, and how you fall. And it can really vary when you walk in the front door. This is one of the challenges that we face. It almost depends on who's working the door that day sometimes as to whether or not um, you, you get access to services, um, which is the other thing to be aware of when you go into the America's Job Center, um, because there are different partners sort of co-located um, and different people are familiar with different things. Um, and that makes it particularly challenging as well. But there are some services that everybody should have access to. Um, if you are a job seeker, I always recommend um, getting yourself registered at mwejobs.org. Um, that um, lists all sorts of job opportunities and is a great source. It's not the only tool, but one tool in your toolkit when you're um, looking for employment. Um, we actually partnered closely with them at the start with COVID because um, there were people with disabilities who were still looking for jobs and there were employers who were still looking for employees um, and particularly the providers. And so we were able to partner with the providers who were looking for direct support um, staff 
um, to ensure that their job openings were listed. There's a, a bullet when you go to MWE jobs that you can hit that, that's COVID jobs um, so that those positions were open there. And I would certainly encourage the SILs when you're looking to hire um, to also use that as a, a source of uh, to look for potential candidates. So there were these eligibility changes. Um, now I have to say that our State Department of Labor in crafting the Maryland State um, Plan um, really cast a broad net in terms of their benchmarks, in terms of their input and so forth. Um, and also in terms of that documentation of disability, because that's also what we get into, as I like to say, the disability community is, is deemed eligible. Like you guys are subjected to, to more different eligibility processes than any other population. Um, and so they really tried to cast as broad a net in terms of what documentation um, you'd need to provide to show that you were an individual with a disability. Um, there's actually been a change at the federal level um, that has allowed us to broaden it even further. So if you go into the America's Job Center and you choose to disclose as an individual with a disability, you can do something that's called self-attestation, which basically says, I am a qualified individual with a disability and you do not have to provide any documentation, which I think is like so exciting um, that, that, that they have been able to remove that as, as a barrier to accessing services. So, um, so there are these capacity and, and impacts and then there are these hiring concerns. Um, and Lori, I saw your question about hiring. The problem is that um, in state government, when positions open up um, because of the state fiscal pressures, there's a, a waiver process that you have to go through. Um, and there's several layers depending on where you are um, in the system. So MDOD, because we're such a small department, um, you know, that, that's done sort of at, at Secretary Beatty's level and our, our Deputy Secretary John Brennan, um, and they make those determinations. And then it goes to DBM um, to make the decision um, and to request the waiver if necessary. Um, Vocational rehabilitation doors, however, is under the State Department of Education. And unfortunately, um, because they're under the State Department of Education, I think, and this is just my personal viewpoint, that sometimes they sort of end up being a lower priority because education is so important. There's all this emphasis on Kerwin and so forth that, that if education has to decide between sort of putting forward positions that they need filled, versus doors that sometimes doors may not end up um, faring as well in that. Now, I wish that it shouldn't have to be a decision that, that the superintendent has to make between sort of is education more important than vocational rehabilitation. Um, one of the other things to be aware of is, so under the vocational rehabilitation system, there are two large components. There's the disability determination um, services that's actually funded by SSA um, and it is 100%, those positions are actually 100% funded by the Social Security Administration. Um, and you can't sort of use those positions for anything else. They can only be doing this, the work for Social Security. Um, the rest of the positions under the Division of Rehabilitation Services, if, you, if you've noted on their website, um, they say um, that their funding is 78 point something. I like to round it up and say it's almost 80% federally funded. Um, now I have to say in my position, I don't quite understand why we wouldn't want to then be trying to fund positions that are predominantly federally funded, but folks may not be aware of that. And that certainly would be an education and awareness point to say, you know, these, these positions only cost the state sort of 22 point odd percent and they're positions that are helping to get people to work. And so therefore that seems to be a really good investment like for the state in terms of the return on the investment if you're just looking at the state costs. Um, I did also want to point out, we have a new state superintendent, um, and it is very clear that he is, um, he's is—he's got a three-year contract, and he's being charged with um, the Kerwin, the Blue Ribbon Task Force, because education has gotten a bunch of money, um, and he needs to make things happen and have some results within three years. Um, he's very focused on issues related to equity, dropouts, poverty, um, and, and so forth. I don't 
I've, I've do an extensive research. So when new people come into leadership at the state level, I like to know, huh, I wonder what their experience or knowledge is with disability. He doesn't have a whole lot of knowledge and experience with disability. And I think that there is this perception that, um, and, and I know it's not unique just to him. I've, I've seen this nationally as well and, and in the state. There's this perception that every person with a disability is in special education and has an IEP, and that's not accurate. There are a number of folks with 504 plans. Um, there are a number of folks who don't have IEPs, either because they don't need it, because academically they're not struggling, or they could not have an IEP because they or their parent didn't show up or didn't consent to having that IEP. Um, we also, so we also have a lot of folks um, with non-obvious disabilities who aren't part of that special education. And even within the special education world, this, I think there's a perception that if you have special education and you have an IEP, you're just gonna be coming out and going to DDA. However, it, that's a really broad pool. So there are people in special education who are missing a high school diploma by maybe one assessment or one class. And as they've added on the class requirements, there are more people who are not getting high school diplomas, which I find a little troubling. Um, and then there is this, this population that ranges across a broad array of skills and abilities um, that some of whom I think even 10 or 20 years ago might have actually been able to exit with a high school diploma. Um, and so I think that there's a real need to help raise the understanding and awareness that A, having an IEP doesn't guarantee that you're gonna have anything when you exit school. Um, and if you don't graduate with a high school diploma, um, you know, how do we keep you on a career pathway, particularly if, if you're not eligible for supports? Now, one of the changes that um, the State Department of Education is making that I'm very excited about um, is for students who had IEPs who weren't exiting with high school diplomas, but were more likely to exit it at 21, but possibly sooner as well, they get a certificate, there, there are now going to be endorsements attached to those certificate students in three areas, um, community, work, and post-secondary education. And there'll be competencies and standards, um, but I feel like it's really going to help create some focus on the services that they get when they're no longer getting a high school diploma, but may still be getting um, supports and services through the school system to really focus on skills and abilities that translate into community living, that translate into post-secondary because we are creating post-secondary programs for students who don't have high school diplomas, but can still benefit from that, including the, the new University of Maryland program, which is very exciting, um, but also keeping that emphasis on workplace. Um, and the other thing that's interesting to know about the new superintendent is he is not interested in hearing from leadership, right? He wants to meet real people out in the communities. And so one of the things that I would encourage you all, particularly as the heads of SILs, to be thinking about if you're providing pre ed services or there are opportunities for him to come and engage and to see the population that you work with, maybe issuing some invitations to see if he'll come out so that we can really help broaden his framework um, and also to help him to understand the importance of vocational rehabilitation and the fact that because it falls under MSDE, you know, we need for him to not, not, not support or not value it, um, but rather to, to be including that um, as, as a priority in all the work that, that they're doing um, and so forth. Um, so let me, there are a couple of things coming up in the chat. Um, and Cheryl, yes, there's also a perception that everyone with an IDD, IDD has an IEP is in special education. That's not true either. And so we really need to help sort of broaden this education's view of, of disability. Um, and Lori, I see you ask, how can we educate him and advocate on behalf of persons with disabilities? Um, have I at, answered your question thus far? Or could, would you like me to, you're on mute, but um, would you like me to, to, to can give some more thoughts? Well, you said that he wants to hear from people not mm -hmm. in leadership. So, like in other words, not from the head of doors. He wants to hear mm -hmm. from people. Up. So, so we we really need to get something together and go to him. This is terrible. So I do not work for doors. Um, again, I work for the um, Department of Disabilities. 
um, which is why sometimes I can share some information that doors, you know, may be less comfortable sharing, um, you know, um, and, um, and so, yeah, I think that helping to raise that awareness and education, um, also thinking about because the legislature was very involved in the creation of Kerwin and that's driving a lot of what's happening, um, ensuring that the legislature is educated and understands um, the impact um, of MSDE and doors and employment and so forth, um, you know. That kind of, they kind of give us a purpose this session. I mean, yes, right. yeah, yes, yeah. But would it, would it be a worthwhile endeavor to have have him on one of these calls and have us talk to him? I mean, that I think it's I think it's worth I am a firm believer in people always have the right to ask, you know, to engage and so forth. So, you know, I, I leave that to your leadership to decide. But, you know, I always encourage people to 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 reach out and to elevate and to educate, um, so, you know, and to hear from the disability community. So. So does he decide where this money is going? In other words, so so doors doors can hire specialists because of what he's deciding. Well, and 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 it's not always necessarily within his power. So it may be the HR at the State Department of Education that's making those decisions. It's not always clear, sort of where things get stuck. Um, but in theory, he has the power to at least not be part of the barrier to it. Um, you know, so, um, and then the, the, the funding that comes, so Maryland is a unique state. Um, the governor usually um, sets the budget. Now the, the departments send requests in, they're usually told what the mark needs to be and then they can send in above the mark requests. Um, but the governor very much has that control in Maryland above and beyond federal dollars. Um, when it goes from the governor to the legislature, as I understand it, and some of you folks who are more legislatively may know better than, than me, but the legislature can cut funds, but they can't add to. So even if you go to the legislature and say, hey, I have this really great idea, I want you to add $100,000 in, they can't add money. In other states, they can. Um, Maryland's pretty unique. The governor in this state has a lot of, of power. Um, yeah. The other thing that I would encourage you guys to, to think about is as we're heading into a new political season, how are you educating all of the candidates, not picking sides, um, because I think that these issues are bipartisan issues um, and making certain that that everybody is aware of these things so that whomever comes in in leadership positions down the line has the knowledge and awareness. Mike, go ahead. Yeah, <clears throat> where to start? <laughs> yeah, no. We, we go round and round about this issue of funding voc rehab and the, the tragedy, I don't know what the budget is for voc rehab now, somewhere around 40 million, I think. Um, and I guess I'd like to figure out some data over the last 10 years of how many pin, how many employee, how employee positions Doors has given up because I think that would help us in our battle to get the organization a little so bit more So I will attention. tell you where that information is typically located. No. Um, when the legislate, when when there's a budget hearing, there's a legislative no. report and an right. analyst report. Um, right, but so, I'd like to see it over the last like ten years or so, yeah. so we can so that we can take a look at the trend. Here's my problem, and it's always been my problem, and that is that as long as doors is buried in the Department of Education as long as they are in afterthought and a dangling participle in a massive budget that really focuses on kids, then they're, then we're never going to have a really effective employment program. We need to move the department out of there or the, the Division of Rehabilitation Services out of there where we can get focused on it and make a difference. Um, it's, it's pathetic what we've got now. And it's not Doors' fault. I'm not criticizing the people who work there. I'm just saying if you're in the long, if you're in the wrong location, nothing much good can really happen over time. And I will say, I looked at, I, I, I was all excited when the, the president's budget came out. I was like so excited because I thought, oh, like there's this huge amount of money for VR. This is going to be great. And when I look at the breakdown, it was all in competitive grants. It wasn't actually in the state. And Maryland, let me also say that there is a there is a formula that the feds use to dole dollars out 
And because of Maryland's sort of, I think, average income disability aside, like yep. we end up with the short end of the stick. Like, so there's also some inherent flaws. And I will also tell you, I'm surprised that there isn't a new head of RSA that's been appointed yet. Um, I keep waiting to see. And um, when I read the monitoring report um, about a year ago or two years ago, um, RSA basically was saying to Doors, you're doing this, this, and this wrong, but we can't tell you how to do it right. And I don't think that that is at all a helpful view from the federal level, because, you know, if we're going to hold folks accountable, that's great, but we need to be able to say, here's how you do it right. Here's how you should have done it. But to say you're doing it wrong, but, you know, but we're not going to tell you what right is, I think also then means that doors is is very very conservative in the actions or the changes that they that they do make because they're afraid they're going to get dinged and there is now under WIOA if they don't start to meet these same things they're going to have to give money back and the other thing that WIOA did is placed a real strong emphasis on high school diplomas and so forth without acknowledging that that isn't all individuals with disabilities which like I, I think that their intent was to try and increase the number of people who are getting diplomas, but, but it has a negative effect, particularly as our state continues to add, and I see this as a parent, like their graduation requirements keep going up. I mean, I looked at what the math requirements were and I'm like, holy crap, I'm only, I'm not certain I graduate from high school in the current environment. So as we add these things, you know, there's, there's a lack of acknowledgement that there may be unintended consequences on folks that, you know, that then if you don't have a high school diploma, it makes it harder to be employed. Well, and I guess my argument would be that it's more about location than money, because note that the folks in the developmental disabilities part of the Maryland Department of Health have received significant increases over the years. The last time I checked, they were spending over $250 million on the DD population for employment, not, not but that's anything also else. because of the advocacy. And I, I was remember, just going to say, it's not money, yeah, it's advocacy. Yeah, yeah. And we as and people will, with disabilities have a responsibility to go advocate, but advocating strongly and effectively, I think people have lost hope because the agency has languished for 40 years now. Well, and I, but I will tell you that I had a conversation with Bob Burns, for those of you who've been around yeah. a while, um, and, and I remember him saying to me at one point in time, well, you know, but DDA gets all the money. And I said, yeah, well, they have a waiting list. So they have compelling numbers. And mm -hmm. I said, you know, Bob, I said, Bob, you don't have a waiting list. So everyone thinks that you're managing. And he said, well, we don't want to give well, he's, he's like, we don't want to give people false hope. And I said, but then you don't have the numbers to sort of say, well, so he, that's when they started their waiting list. And later that year, because education was on the outs with the governor and with the legislature, like they were able to actually, they decided to put in an increase for VR because they thought that they might be able to get support for that. Um, and they did. And that's the only time that at we one time, $5 million. And yep. then it's never happened since. Yep. Yep. And, it's, yep. and it's a travesty for those of you who want jobs, who want assistance from a competent quality rehabilitation department without staff turnover. If you want some stability, I think we have to move the department away from Department of Education. Look, the library services even left the Department of Ed last year because they wow. couldn't get any attention to their own wow. budget. So, you know, um, I, the, maybe the time is right and let education focus on education and not on vocational rehabilitation. Yeah. Well, I can take, I, I, I'm I not advocating Jay, any position as it relates to that. Um, but, uh, you have a minute, Jay? Yes, absolutely. Okay, as a are you familiar with Shepherd Pratt or with uh, Mosaic or Alliance Inc? Yes, I am familiar with all of those. Yes, well, I'm I'm with them. You know, I have a job. You, yes, uh, do you do you also have you also worked with uh, Workforce Technology Center? Yes, I. They don't still have an overnight program anymore over there, right? They do not. No, um, and. And I'd be curious to know what your experience was because I know that some uh, folks feel like it's a segregated setting and there might be benefits to moving out of that setting into a more integrated. Well, um, well I used to be there a long time ago. Mm -hmm. see? And fortunately, you know, that that didn't work out. I was with Doors, Miss Bucks was there. You familiar with Jocelyn Crockett? Mm -hmm. Yes, I used to work with her. She's still with Doors, right? 
uh, she may have retired. I have to tell you, there are so many people retiring or taking other jobs from doors. It is really, really difficult to keep up with who is still there. Um, yeah, well, you familiar with people on the go? Yes, absolutely. Yes, they're having a thing this uh, Thursday. Uh, uh, was a uh, uh, advocacy conference if you want to go on. This, uh, that is awesome. Yes, I through. saw that. People on the go does some good work. But remind them that that we could always use their help in advocating on behalf of doors as well. And the other thing I will tell you all is there is a client assistance program. And so if if you're encountering challenges with doors, I would always encourage you to to contact the client assistance program. Um, they, yeah, do they, they also, are very short staffed, Abiola. Uh, very, very short staffed. Mm -hmm. They also help with financial illiteracy for people with disabilities. You know, under pre employment transition services, they, they should. Um, MD Cash also has some programming if you're not familiar with them. Um, MD, can you send that, me that? I will website? send those. Yep. Thank you. Mm hmm. Because you're right, that financial literacy piece is a really important piece. So, so you're with uh, Maryland, what is it, DDA? Uh, no, the Department of Disability. So we're a little different than DDA. We're actually charged with um, improving the coordination and collaboration um, and delivery of services to people with disabilities. So we do more policy and we work across all of the partners. Can you send oh, me your- you, email address i mean yeah. can you send me the website please uh, mike just posted it cashmd.org um and jade there was a uh, another question um it says can't the legislature attach mandated funding to bills so they can like in the case of the Kerwin Commission, but they had to have enough votes to overcome the veto. So they do it on occasion, but it is a pretty, pretty high bar that they have to, to meet um, in order to be able to, to do that. Um, yeah, I wanted to clarify just for your own help, Jade, a little bit. You're absolutely right. Maryland is the only state where the governor, the governor's budget, the legislative assembly can add or can subtract from it, but they can't add to it. Mm -hmm. However, the way that works out in practice is that somewhere around the middle of the session, the leaders of the assembly and the Senate and the House get together with the governor and say, listen, if you want what you want to get and we want to get what we want to get, we're going to have to make a deal here. Mm -hmm. And that's when your package of new and increased funding that wasn't in the governor's budget can be brought to life, but it really does require that the agency that wants this money has a strong constituency out there that is working to get those numbers in the budget and then defend them and advocate for them. And I'm not suggesting that, you know, the independent living center should go this alone. I think that there's, I oh, think no. that the DD advocates have skin in this game as well. Like, you we know, all do. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We all have we all have skin in this employment game and there's no, you know, there's no better way to overcome some of the issues surrounding our disabilities than to be able to say I have a job and, and it pays well. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Well, it, and now is like like employers are desperate like if we were robustly staffed with well-paid, you know, um like job, you know, um coaches and job developers and doors was fully staffed and so forth. Like we, like we could be out there creating all sorts of opportunities for people with disabilities. I mean, that's the irony, yeah. right? Like yeah. the times when the, when we might have the best chance of actually making the case and getting jobs and being able to demonstrate what's possible are the times when we're suffering because of our own workforce shortages and so forth. So, yeah. Other questions, concerns? Are you familiar with the Disability Expo? The Disability Expo? Yes, I am. Yes, Caring Communities? Uh-huh. Yes. Well, you know, did you know they're having a one on, uh, what is it, on the 23rd of next month? Yes. I Alice, think are, are you going or you think it's going to be virtual? 
Um, I, I'm afraid it may be virtual. I, I don't know what, it's difficult to know what's going to happen right now in the current environment. Um, and I do know that um, I was on, so there's a national um, session around disability employment that looks at the disability trends. And I was at on the end tide um, call last week. Um, and what's going to be interesting to, to see is now that the um, extended unemployment has ended, is there going to be an increase in SSI and SSDI um, applications? There had not been um, throughout much of COVID, which was interesting, but are we gonna have more people exiting the workforce um, in part because of the emphasis on return to work um, and so forth? Um, and there is a lot of information out there um, about COVID and long COVID as a, as a qualified disability um, and ensuring that workplaces, you know, are willing to accommodate remote um, working as, as an accommodation if necessary, if they're implementing a, a mandatory return to, to the office. Okay. So Jay, mm -hmm. Jay, this is Bong. Um, so, so I have a question for you um, regarding the, um, uh, the pandemic, um, you know, and the shortage of, of, of workers with doors. Um, and I guess um, uh, their, their workload, um, the, the uh, counselors' workloads. Um, ha has there been, um, since the end of the state of emergency, has there been any, um, I guess, uh, instances or cases or even complaints um, about um, counselors not being able to follow up with with uh, specific cases, because um, I because I know it's it 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 it's it's all about like um, you know um, getting th that particular individual you know into the workforce and so forth and so forth. Um, but there are other things you know that come along with that. Um, for example, you know uh, specific or specified training, um, you know trade training. Um, as, as well. Um, and then even for some people in order to um, keep their employment um, possible, uh, you know, driving, um, you know, school and, 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 and being able to do driving training. Um, so I'm just curious to, to, to know, has there been any um, uh, output or, 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 or people complaining about um, counselors not following up with them or, you know, um, possible even instances of of cases getting getting dropped or or falling through the cracks so yes we have gotten some constituent concerns um and i think one of the challenges is that yes their caseloads their caseloads at the best of times were were always high um mm -hmm. and um and i think that they have tried to improve their computer system, but there still are, is problems with, with paperwork not getting completed um, and so forth. The other thing to keep in mind is that a lot of what the DOORS counselors do is actually they, they process paperwork to purchase services, right? So DOORS isn't doing the customized training, but they're purchasing services from you all or from someplace else on behalf of an individual, um, mm -hmm. which means that there is that opportunity for paperwork to get to, to not get filed in time. And when they have such huge caseloads, being able to get that turned around, um, they are also under a mandatory return to the office. Um, mm -hmm. The State Department of Education has decided that all of their staff need to return. Um, and that's having some implications because there are some people who I think, you know, um, because DOORS does make a concerted effort to hire individuals with disabilities, um, being forced to go back in depending on the nature of your immune system might have an impact um, as well. I'm sure that they're accommodating those individuals, but um, there are a number of factors at play. But yes, we have received some, I'm surprised we haven't received more, um, to be honest. Um, and, and part of me feels like it's almost like battle fatigue. Like, like I've been with the state for 24 years and for 24 years, everybody's been frustrated by doors. And so they're almost like so worn down that, that nobody's up in arms. It's like been, you know, to be expected or something like that. So, oh, Cheryl, you can't figure out how to raise your hand. Yeah, so. I'm, I'm at my cubicle. I don't know how to use this computer. Um, 
So I have an employment related question that is unrelated to doors. Is that okay? Absolutely. Um, so I thankfully have um, a very understanding employer right now, thankfully. Um, but I'm wondering uh, for people who maybe are disabled but don't work in disability as their career, um, the ridiculously unreliable transportation situation uh, that's going on right now, um, is that leading to, um, are we seeing an increase in people being laid off right now? Because that's something I'm concerned about. Well, I am so glad that my colleague Bong is here today with me. <laughs> not, I, I'm presuming not in his official capacity, um, <laughs> but I will take a step. So I don't know that anyone has, I have not heard any questions or concerns about people having lost jobs um, as a result of the unreliable nature of um, yeah, and Bong, how come you haven't got this fixed yet? <laughs> um, but we were actually just talking about it this morning um, because because I'm also sort of personally facing this. My daughter's sort of a, a double jeopardy bus rider, right? So they pick her up earlier in the morning and later in the afternoon. So she loses an hour out of her day. And given that she's a high school student, that hour is a big deal. And, and the more that I learn about transportation, the more that I think that part of the problem is however they design the computers that sort of design these routes and so forth, like they're not, they're, they're choosing the wrong metrics or the wrong things to focus on because, you know, um, you know, Bong was telling us about a trip last night where like, you know, it looked like he was heading one way and then all of a sudden they take them off another way and it didn't make any sense, you know, um, and, 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 now, Bong, is that being done by hand then, or is that being done through through a, a system? Because I just think that the analytics and so forth, you know, right. I mean, I've actually advocated to Bong that, that they should look at everybody who has consistent rides, like Monday through Friday um, right. in, in certain areas. So like if there's a group of folks that you know Monday through Friday are going to work for the most part, like, you know, and they're all sort of going from, you know, one part of, you know, a, a suburb outside of, you know, or part of Baltimore City to downtown, because most of our commuting migration patterns are similar. Like, why wouldn't they be trying to coordinate those within a set area and moving them from sort of one community to another community nearby, as opposed to this sort of, like, it's almost like an exercise and how far can we make somebody go, like, and how long, you know, um, and double back right. and duplicate. Right. So to make a long answer, very, very short. Um, so it, 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 the scheduling is done by both. It, it, it's done um, by a program called Trapeze. Um, and then when there are changes being made to that particular manifest, then it, 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 it becomes a mixture of Trapeze and manually um, being done. Um, the, and, and, and your point about um, community um, or, or geographically, um, that is great. Um, the, the, the monkey wrench in, in that is when cancellations come up um, or when um, unfortunately there are a shortage of drivers and then other drivers have to pick up more jobs, mm -hmm. um, then, then unfortunately the, the, the demographics and the geographical areas um, that these people are in, then all of a sudden just become you know, a disarray. Um, and to answer um, Cheryl's question, um, as of this moment, no, there has not been um, any instances that I'm aware of um, or that MTA has informed me of um, as, as, as far as, um, you know, um, the uh, loss of jobs because of transportation. And I just um, I see that Nikki posted, um, and I was unaware of this, um, she was just informed by Doors that the travel training program that they were sponsoring is suspended as of now because of their employment shortages, but they may be able to offer some that's another thing that I have um, been, Bong will tell you, harping on, um, that we need more access to travel training in the, in the state. Um, and I know- Yes, um, and that actually, yes, and actually um, anyone who was not on the 
um, MTA town hall meeting last Monday evening. Um, just FYI, uh, travel training is something that the um, that that MTA mobility is planning to implement uh, very, 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 very soon. I don't have a specific date at the moment, but they are planning to re-implement uh, travel training. That's that's good news, particularly if Doris is cutting it off. I've been asking that Bong's predecessor. I used to ask all the time too, what's happening with travel training? What's happening with travel training? So um, Cheryl, had a, Cheryl Grossman had a question. Hello, thank you. This is Cheryl. Um, I just had a question systemically, and I've seen this across states with uh, vocational rehab systems, is that there seems to be a bucket of folks who have high technology or modification needs in higher skill level and high pay, higher paying jobs that get served by uh, vocational rehabilitation, or those who sort of get the, the gamut of uh, developmental uh, services all the way in, and a lot of the jobs offered are entry level. But there are so many that fall into that gray area who need the cognitive support at all levels of employment, which to me seems like the whole point for doing vocational rehabilitation. And I'm just wondering, how do we, as a system, move that forward? Because there are just so many folks who are either settling for lower jobs or who are just not getting the services in the jobs that they can stay in because they don't have enough of the support that they need. So thinking about it holistically from a policy perspective, I think that when vocational rehabilitation was first introduced, the, the, the work world was very different, right? So my grandfather went to work for the same organization was there his entire life. His, you know, his son-in-law went to work there. His sons went to work there, then got laid off because that's, you know, manufacturing blue collar. But anyway, and so, and so the whole design of the VR system, I think was designed to accommodate a very outdated work model um, because VR, you know, considers a successful placement 90 days and then more, we're done. A, B, um, some of the models that are available um, under the DD in terms of that longer term supports, and, but maybe less intense supports, or that customized employment that is used for um, the most individuals with more significant disabilities, um, I believe are models that should be being looked at across the array of skills and abilities and not just limited to entry level. And in fact, I've, I've done some research on this and it's interesting because in the computer industry, um, in part because so much of it is based on sort of skill and ability that you, you develop on your own, um, they're not, you know, they don't look for degrees and so forth. They look for skills and abilities and then align them with, with the hiring needs. Um, and they actually have a term that I'm going blank, um, but it's a very interesting model um, that some businesses are pivoting to um, because right now, you know, you're very much um, stuck with you know, business says, this is what my needs are. And, and they put together this laundry list that sometimes it's like, you know, we expect you to speak three languages, you know, be able to ride a unicycle and, you know, type, um, you know, uh, a 20 page manifesto within a 20 minute period, um, you know, and by the way, we're going to pay you minimum wage um, with their expectations. Um, and, and that I think is when you have business sort of creating a set of define skills and then looking for somebody who checks off all of those boxes is where people with disabilities face the greatest barriers, right? Because you may be able to do 80% of the job better than somebody who can do 100% of, of the job. Um, and, you know, I would love to see customized employment modified to accommodate a broader spectrum and be a service or a supporter that job development support be available more broadly with business um, that is that sort of alignment of, of strengths and skills with business needs. And, and I think that if we could figure out how to frame it to business and actually fund that as a support, um, that, that business would be really receptive to it, um, particularly in the current environment where they're struggling. Um, you know, so, so there, but there is a disconnect in that funding and that perception. Um, we see this particularly with individuals who 
um, have college degrees or some college who may have um, autism. Um, you know, these are individuals that could benefit from some longer term supports, but not nearly the level of intensity of support that individuals um, with IDD might need, um, and yet they're not eligible, you know, um, and that's, that's a huge population we're hearing from. That's, that's a population that we are hearing from quite often, um, and these are individuals who oftentimes not to, to buy into stereotypes, but we're hearing from their parents because they're sitting at home, um, and, and they've had work, but they're not able to maintain that work, um, because of some of those disconnects and so forth, um, and it's and that number is increasing. Um, and because they're not eligible for doors funding, um, you know we've got we've got some businesses interested in some different things that we're trying to figure out how to put together. But that that lack of funding um, really is an impediment. That you know if we could get enough you know, supports to get them started and maybe to help the business to understand, you know, where the strengths are and to do that alignment. Now, we also have, I have a business who actually approached me because they had an individual and they used funds through their accommodation um, to bring in a job coach. Um, and that's been a very successful um, relationship and, and the business invested in and paid for those costs, which is, which is great. And I hope we can get business to see the value of that and do more of that. All right. Well, I, you know, we are, I think, heading towards the end. Today ends at three, right? All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I think, um, you know, other questions, um, if you'd like, you can put them in the chat and I can get them off to Jade and get everyone an answer. Um, but I'd like um, to leave some you're time familiar for with community yeah. services of. Hey, uh, Kiyoki, yeah. we need to wrap up, okay? Yep. Go ahead and put it in the chat box and I'll, I'll, get, the, I'll get the question off to Jade. So I have an um, announcement. Okay, I great. So um, I I just put in the chat and then I'll turn it over to Mike um, that ARI is hiring a full time independent living specialist, forty hours a week, um, eighteen fifty an hour with um, health, vision, dental, short term, long term, accidental death, which won't happen, and life insurance and a simple <laughs> IRA. So um, if you're interested, we are a progressive, flexible work environment. So um, Mike, over to you. Uh, just just quickly, uh, at the Image Center next Thursday night on September 30th at 7 o'clock is our annual Solutions 2020 event where we show you some of the devices we've been creating this year for people with disabilities, some of the customized engineering work we've been doing. We've got a partnership with MIT to talk about, and we've got a partnership with an organization called Milbat in Israel. So there's a lot of exciting things going on. If you get a chance, um, I put the link and to the to the Solutions event in the chat. Click on it, go there, get your uh, uh, get your get your tickets, and show up. So thank you all very much. And don't forget about this on uh, Thursday. Yes, people on the goes conference. Yes. Thank you, Are you going to be on it, Katie? I sent it to you. I know I did. I I actually will not be on it. I have a couple conflicts. I'm sorry. And I'm Pew 